organization is currently a 501c4, but we want to switch to a 501c3 so that we're eligible for tax deductible donations. Is that possible? And how do we do that? It is possible, but unfortunately, it's not as easy as you might think. So there's there's no box to check. There's not just a form that you send to the IRS and says, hey, we want to go from a C4 to a C3. Um, you actually have to start over. So you'd actually have to file the Form 1023 with the IRS. Um, luckily, you have already have an EIN, so you don't need to do that again. But you form a, a 1023 with the IRS and do all of the, the other paperwork that you need to do to make sure that your board is set up properly. Um, you pay the fee, whatever the fee is for your size organization, um, and then you wait and get your 501c3 back from the IRS. Um, then once that exists, then you would just move all of the assets from the 501c4 over to the 501c3. You just basically close the 501c4, move all the assets over to the 501c3. Um, that is easy to do. Um, it's not it's not like extra complicated. There aren't additional rules about that conversion, but it just it does involve doing all the work over again. And it does take quite a bit of time. Do you have to notify? I mean, I'm assuming if donors or people made, you know, whomever made gifts to the 501c4, um, is it prudent or from a legal standpoint, is there anything you need to notify them if you're moving it to the 501c3? Is there is there any reason people need to be worried about that they probably should let them know that the right. C4 is being closed, uh, just so that they understand that the the lobbying rules are going to be different for you because C3 and C4 have different rules about what they can and can't lobby. Right. Um, so so yeah, I think you would it would be smart to do that. Yeah. I'm just incidentally, it is you can't do it the other way around. You can't go from a C3 to a C4 uh, without going through an awful lot of extra steps because none of that money is going to be eligible for the for the C4. So that's a little more complicated. Yeah, so that's more complicated, but that wasn't the question, so we won't answer that one. Right. <laughs> Nonprofit government. Nonprofit answers. Nonprofit board. Nonprofit management. Nonprofit marketing. Nonprofit resources. The Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits presents Nonprofit Everything, the podcast about everything nonprofit, with your host Andy Shurick and Stacy Wedding. Hello, everybody, and welcome again to another episode of Nonprofit Everything, um, the podcast where we talk about everything nonprofit. Uh, the way this works is you send us questions and we answer the questions. Um, and I'd like to just point out one little extra feature that if you haven't noticed, so if you go to the Nonprofit Everything website, so nonprofiteverything.com, you can also get the same information at the Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits website, which is allianceforNevadaNonprofits.com. And if you look at the podcast episode, you can see there's a time on the bottom of each of those. And if you see a topic that you want to listen to that specific topic, that time tells you where you can start listening to the episode. So if Stacy and I are talking about something you find absolutely irritating, you can just skip it. <laughs> and it can happen. <laughs> <laughs> it will happen. And you can just skip that and go right to the thing that you want. Also, that's a good way to look at older episodes. So if there's a particular board question you think we may have answered already, you can look at the older episodes, find the time, and then just scroll scrub away at that. Again, my name's Andy Shurick. I'm Stacy Wedding. Let's go. All right, Andy, we were looking for sample conflict of interest policies and we're surprised to discover that there were so many out there and they're all very different. Can you point me to a good example and what should they have in them? Yeah. So if you just Google conflict of interest policy, you're going to get infinity yeah. samples and the, overwhelming. Yeah. The problem is, is that 95% of them are going to be, are going to be related to for profits. So you're going to read it and it's going to talk about uh, that directors need to be disinterested and they shouldn't have a conflict of interest and they shouldn't vote on anything that they may have a financial interest in. Right. Um, the, the challenge is that that, while that applies well to a for profit, that doesn't translate well to nonprofits mm -hmm. because while, yes, there will be opportunities for people on a nonprofit board, and you, see, you know, if you read any blog posts or anything about nonprofits, you hear about this happening all the time, where somebody's mad because the sister of the board chair owns an apartment complex, and now the executive director is renting an apartment from that apartment complex, and somebody else on the staff is super mad about it because right. they think it's a conflict of interest and it shouldn't happen, right? Um, so, so that does happen, where you've got the financial all conflict the of interest all the time. But but when you think about nonprofits, it's not necessarily all about the money anyway. It's about the relationships. Yeah. So we'll pose a, a hypothetical question because I love hypothetical questions. Great for <laughs> podcasts. 
Um, the, if you have, for example, a board member who happens to sit on more than one board, there is a funder who has created a grant opportunity, uh, and it's going to be a, a competitive grant. And, and both of the organizations that this board member is, is on the board for will be trying to get this grant. Right. How does the board member help? Does the board member pick and choose? Does the board member say, or, or even better, the, it's the organization that the board member works for. You know, the board member works for a foundation and the foundation right. is giving money away. Like then when they're talking about potential funding that they get, does that foundation board member then have a conflict of interest in that particular activity? Anything that that board is talking about. Yeah. And then you get into confidentiality, right? And the conflict of that board member, perhaps. I mean, I see it happen a lot, right? Where you have someone because, you know, and it's also Nevada and many of our communities are small communities at the end of the day. And so when you think about it, it's easy for us, you know, someone to be on your board and be on two other boards and boards that may have similar missions. And at the end of the day, what do they do if maybe the other two organizations would really be great to apply for this. Like other, like, do they tell, do they share this information? Oh, I heard from this organization about this grant opportunity. Right. Um, I, you know, I think what we're talking about and I, I've, there's some great articles out there. Blue avocado is one of my favorite resources. And one of the things they talk about is the idea of this kind of conflict of loyalty. And I think conflict of interest policies actually really, You've got the typical language you talked about earlier, Andy, but it's also about this kind of conflict of loyalty because that's what that is. I mean, by like legal definition, right, it's, you know, it's it's kind of the the financial gain someone would get. But then there is the relationship piece, which is kind of the soft side of the conflict. But mm-hmm. that's where people are getting into the biggest um struggles, I think, in within their organization. So how do you so addressing that in a conflict policy? um and addressing kind of that perceived conflict, right? What do you do if there is a perception of some kind of conflict? And that gets more process oriented, but it's almost got to be touched on to some degree that you have a mechanism to deal with that, not just outright conflict. Oh, yes, I have a potential financial interest in this, so I've disclosed it. But like, what if someone perceives that Stacey Wedding has a conflict with something? How, how does that kind of unravel. I, I think those are so important. I think for that's, a, that's a great like swing right back into the question, yeah. which is like, what's a good conflict of interest policy. And so the, uh, what we would be recommending then is to make sure that it's not just a fiduciary financial only right. conflict of interest policy, but it's a conflict of loyalty policy. Yes. So you owe a duty of loyalty to the nonprofits you're a board member of, um, or a staff member of you're, you owe a duty of loyalty to your own organization. Um, and you need to be held accountable for that duty of loyalty. So the the process that you would put in place, the same way with a financial process, is you have to, number one, disclose it. So at the beginning, you need to do this and, and make it part of what you do all the time. It shouldn't be like once a year you send a secret piece of paper to the executive assistant who types it into a Word document, right? right? It needs to be something that gets discussed and is shared throughout the rest of the board. So everybody knows, okay, you, Stacy, are on all five of these boards. You've listed right. all five of these boards. Here are the organizations that you work with as clients, like all the stuff that you've got going on. You'd be a terrible person to have on a board, by the way, because you would just be 100% conflict of interest, wouldn't you? <laughs> so, so and, then, and then once that's all available, then make sure that you're bringing that up and talking about it all the time so that anytime any activity comes up, you know, if it's something that you could potentially have a conflict on and there's a vote, like you can participate in the discussion, you know, make sure that's part of your policy, make sure that it's okay to participate in the discussion, but also you need to be exiting the room for part of the discussion exactly. and the vote. Exactly. So if you, if you're on another board and there's an opportunity that is reflective of multiple organizations, you need to be out of the room for the vote. There's so, a great educational opportunity with it to your point, Andy. I feel like it's what, what I see at most organizations. I don't think I've seen any do it like in a way that could really educate and kind of inform people like it's, oh, here's this document. So if they do do it once, you know, if they send out the policy once a year and you have to like sign it or whatever and say you got it, it's just like, yep, sign it, return it. And like it's it. right and ignore it. And no one really even knows what they're signing. They're just signing something. But what a cool opportunity at a board meeting to take 10 minutes and do one of those hypothetical questions you just did. Right. And ask, so what would we do if right. And, and kind of it's like great it's great conversation, right? And it gets boards thinking more generatively and strategically about these kinds of things that they should be thinking about. 
Yeah. So, so the best conflict of interest policy, you know, I would fish through all of the ones that are online. Blue Avocado is probably a really good place to start, yes. honestly. Um, and look at all of the conflict of interest policies that are out there. And then using that understanding of conflict of loyalty or duty yeah. of loyalty, and then make sure it applies and then put in a process so that it's, it's something that you're talking about all the time. And it's not just something that you do once a year. Is that something that Anne has um, on their website or maybe the National Association of Nonprofits has? I know they have a bunch of sample policies. Or is that another resource? Yeah, the Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits. If you're, if you're a member and you go to the members area, there's a section where you can get access to a whole bunch of sample policies that we've had people look at that um, are, are good policies that we think. Obviously, you're going to want to have your attorney or board look at them to make sure that they're kosher with your organization. But it's one that it's ones that we have vetted. How should organizations manage board retreat expenses? Is it appropriate to reimburse board members for out-of-area travel, for example, lodging, mileage, meals, etc., or does each board member need to pay out of pocket? I really think it's an individual kind of discussion and and agreement in an organization that usually is like a reimbursement policy, right? And I've seen bylaws before where they'll even say, you know, board members are not compensated, but they do, you know, they can uh, have be reimbursed for things that are approved or have some kind of approval process. So I like kind of reimbursement policies um, in this case. And I also think that um, I see most nonprofits, right, that have, if there's some sort of, um, maybe you have board members from all different regions, um, maybe they travel together for this board retreat or whatever the case is, most will say as sort of a thank you to your service, we're willing to cover airfare. But what that means is, you know, um, we want you, it's up to, maybe there's a cap on it, right? Because you also don't want someone going, oh, great. Now I get to fly first class. Mm. Um, I mean, let's hope that doesn't happen. But but I really think having, again, some guidelines, most organizations I see that do this truly um, do take care of their board members' expense, encourage board members if they want to pay, but like say, listen, we got this. You're, you're on our board and that's part of your service and, and we're not expecting you to do that. Now we do expect a nice little give, get thing out of, you know, make sure you give your gift um, throughout the year, but this is separate. This is sort of an expense related to your service. How about you? Yeah, it's, I, I, especially in, like nationwide boards yeah. where the board members aren't necessarily all in the same place. Yeah. Um, and then trying to figure out if the board, if the organization can afford it, um, that it's certainly a legitimate expense. I think, I don't know that, you know, donors are going to be super excited if you're like, you know where we're going to have our board retreat <laughs> is we're going to have it in Hawaii. Oh, <laughs> and, yeah. Right. Good then point. that's a, that's a big challenge that you might have to get over just from the perception problem. I think um, even in Nevada, if you think about it though, right, we've got North and South and that's mm-hmm. quite a distance and there's a lot of, boards here locally, right, that have individuals from the North and the South. And who knows, maybe there's some rurals in there too. At the end of the day, you're like, okay, that's going to cost us money. And that's part of the cost of doing business. Yeah, I think it's a legitimate expense. In a world where there are so many channels to reach out to a donor, For example, email, phone, LinkedIn, social media. What are the best channels for reaching out to new donors? Which channels are appropriate and which aren't? Well, I definitely think we could use some expertise on this other than other than us, probably, Andy. But I would say, I mean, some of I'm going to come back with questions, which is probably going to annoy the person who wrote this, like no, nobody's business. But I mean, I would I would also say kind of what kinds of donors are you trying to reach? Right. Because if I'm going after more corporate figureheads, then probably LinkedIn might make more sense, right, than maybe another kind of social media channel. Although when you actually look at the stats on social media, unless it's like Giving Tuesday or Nevada's Big Give or something that's truly an online giving day, it shows that a lot of that doesn't, you don't convert and get new donors through those channels, unless the exception to that, right, is a peer-to-peer fundraiser. So, oh good, I'm having my birthday fundraiser, right? I mean, then you get donors and then those are, and then I, you know, what I encourage is like, okay, so now you got the donor that probably did it just because they like so-and-so whose birthday it was. So now how do you turn that donor into not just like a one-time short-term donor to a longer one, right? Using channels that that donor likes. Because once you have the donor, it's so easy. You can say, hey, how do you want us to communicate with you, right? But until, but getting that donor, I think you kind of got to just meet 
your donors where they're at. So where are you, what are you trying to do? Like what kinds of donors are you trying to get? And I think that's part of it. Yeah, I'm annoyed too, because I have more questions than answers on this one. I so, know. so in my understanding is, is that you don't really reach, you don't really get donors from advertising right? or from, from showing that you exist. No one's going to care enough. Right. There's too much noise and not enough signal. Yeah. So getting like the first step, I think, is getting somebody interested in your mission. And then, then they maybe want to find out more and then maybe you can convert them into an actual donor, but you need that sort of awareness piece. Nobody just like, you yeah, know, that has their eyes, <laughs> they got their blindfolded and they're just holding their checkbook out and like, absolutely. <laughs> like who am I going to bump into first? You can have the money. So, so I think, you know, the, maybe for reaching out to new donors via some sort of online tool, maybe, I, I don't know, I wouldn't think that that's the smartest way to go anyway. Right. And I think I, to your point, yeah, I mean, I made a big assumption in my answer thinking, okay, you've already done that awareness building. So yeah, it's sort of like a, how are you going to, and, and they show, right, multi-channels. How are you going to reach a donor? How are you going to raise awareness about what you're doing? Well, so what channels? And you really are probably going to need to do it in a variety of communication channels because people aren't just in one channel, which is why this question is such a big question, right? I mean, none of us are just on one social media channel. Yeah. None of us communicate just by phone or email, right? Or text or whatever it is. Like, so thinking about how do you create that communication strategy that reaches that the donor, potential donor keeps seeing your name and like seeing it in different places that maybe they frequent. So um, yeah, I would definitely love to get some more expertise though on this and kind of what's going on out there. Sure. Well, here through the magic of podcasting, we can bring in our expert right now. So I'd like to introduce Heather Curry Frommer. She's a social media expert that's come to answer the question. Take it away, Stacy and Heather. Heather, thanks so much for joining us today. We're so excited to have someone with your expertise. Well, um, Stacy, first, thanks for having me. And really, that is the million dollar question these days. The fact that you're bringing that up is important. And I think organizations need to do that because sometimes you, they stretch themselves too thin. I see organizations on everything, right? They're on Pinterest, they're on Twitter, they're on this and that, and they can't keep up. And that's the worst thing you can do. So really, you know, look at what your organization does and what makes sense for you. Instagram is, is incredibly visual. Um, I have one client right now that I work with that I would never recommend they go on Instagram because they have nothing visual. At all. It's a very, it's challenging, trust me. But I can, I can finagle stuff on Facebook, but I can't make it work for Instagram. Um, so I think it's, you just need to find what works for your organization. I mean, Facebook is, is kind of the original, the leader. So many folks are on it. I don't think you can go wrong with, with Facebook. Uh, but I think once you start branching out to other platforms, especially, you know, you want to get into Pinterest and things of that nature, um, it, 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 you really need to step back and assess what you do and what makes sense. That's great advice. That's great advice because I, like you, have seen that happen and it's um, – Sometimes it's, it's just, it's a shame because you see that if they put all that energy they're putting in spreading it all out towards yes. social media platform, right? It could be so much more effective for them. Right. right. You are always a wealth of knowledge. I could probably talk to you for hours <laughs> after to all of us, but thank you for giving us your time, Heather. Oh, you're so welcome. It was a pleasure. I have always considered myself to be really good at managing my time until my boss promoted me to a management level position. Now I have a never ending to-do list. I feel like I only get well, about two to three of those things on a daily basis, but usually add at least 10 more things to my list. I'm spending so much time prioritizing and reprioritizing almost every day, and I don't feel like I'm getting anywhere. Do you have any guidance? I think everyone listening is probably nodding their head right now saying, we get this, we get this feeling, right? Uh, Okay, so I'm going to take a different approach to this. I, that's more of a personal story, but I hope it helps. So um, I struggle with this, right? And I invested in a health and wellness coach. Uh, shout out to Kelly Travis. She's amazing. And one of the things we talked a bit about was, was kind of time. And so a few things that she's really like, time is not the issue. It's where our priorities are and what we're saying yes to. That's the issue, right? Because at the end of the day, if I'm crystal clear on this is where I'm trying to get to, or this by the end of the day is what I want to get done, I will, if as much as I can, 
maybe I have, you know, maybe I can say no to things or postpone them a day or have my day of like catch up or whatever it is. I think sometimes we all get in this mode of, oh God, I got to like, you know, jump at every fire or emergency. And it kind of just is like an endless cycle when you do that. Right. And so how do you really get crystal clear on starting your day with what do I want to have accomplished by the end of the day? And how am I going to make that happen? Is an hour I carve out like, and just shut my door or what is that? And so, and then being really cognizant of what you're saying yes to, which is an ongoing battle for me, but, um, because, you know, as a people pleaser, it's like, oh, sure. Let me say yes to 10, 10 requests just because I want to help you. And at the end of the day, that's not getting me toward where I need to go. So I think I don't know enough about the, the person who wrote this question, but, Maybe that helps. And, you know, you've got the typical things like calendaring and booking time on your calendar. And I, 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 those are some of the basic things that come to mind for me. How about you? <laughs> you and I are such different people. We are, are we? <laughs> You're so, like, what? I have no problems. No, saying, no, that's no. the opposite. Yeah. That's the opposite. So like, so I, my challenge isn't that I have too many things to do and I've got competing priorities and I've always got new stuff coming down the pipeline that I need to get done. My problem is that I'm full on 25% border collie. And if something I'm working on <laughs> is not, yeah. If something I'm working on is not a hundred percent engaging, like I will find myself somewhere. I like, I will literally get up out of my chair, wander someplace else. I'm like, Oh, how did I get over here? Like, I don't remember getting up because my brain just won't, you know, I, I get to look at the spreadsheet for zero more minutes, get up and I will walk away. Um, and so I find like my personal challenge is more about being able to focus my attention on things that are not super exciting for longer periods of time. Um, and, and one of the, and one of the ways I do that is I've got my email turned so that it doesn't check email constantly. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't, every time a new email comes in, it doesn't pop up on the bottom of my screen and go, Hey Andy, look, a new email. Yeah. It, it only checks it once every 30 minutes. And once every 30 minutes, I'll get 10 emails and, and then I can, okay, I can deal with whatever the important things. That's out of a this great pile. idea. Um, the other things that I, so my phone doesn't have any alerts on it. I got like, I've turned all of the alerts on my phone off. If someone texts me, it doesn't ding. It doesn't do anything. Um, I, I am ADD enough that I will occasionally just pick up my phone to look at it. So it's not like I will miss calls and things. Um, I, I let the phone ring. If someone calls me, I will actually answer the phone. Cause that doesn't nowadays that doesn't happen as much. No, as it, it doesn't. Used to, right? it used doesn't. to be like the phone, you'd be working on something, the phone working, you'd be like, ah, exactly. But now it like never rings. So that's fine. Um, so like finding, finding ways that I can continue to focus myself. Um, I've heard, I don't have this problem, but I've heard that people that, um, will, if they're working on something, they will find themselves like opening up Facebook just to poke around on it. Uh, one of the strategies I heard for that is to actually, you can go in and you can set a timer on it so that when you double click the icon on Facebook or whatever on your computer, that it actually takes 15 seconds to open up the application. Mm. And usually that's long enough for you to go, what am I doing? Like, why am I, why did I <laughs> why? click that? Right. Why? <laughs> or, or if you actually look at, you know, you can see how much time you're spending on social media. It is so depressing when you do that. You're yeah. like, holy crap. How did I waste <laughs> that much time today? Yeah. Yeah. You're like, seriously, how much time? Yeah. I, I don't, that, that I, for me, that's not a problem. That's again, that's my ADD. I don't have time for it. I look at it, I'm like, I'm so bored. Um, but, but that could be something, but like recognizing for, for you, what it is that's slowing for me, recognize what it is that's slowing me down and making me not focus as much as I want, because I don't have any problem. Like I don't sit at my desk for eight straight hours a day and then like work. And then like at the end of the day, stretch and like, Oh, I can't believe how fast that day went. Yeah, that's not me. It's usually about how am I out of my chair again? Like, why am I outside? (laughs) So I don't have problems like, you know, taking time out to like think about things like my brain just goes and I think about things whether I want to think about them or not. So like coming up with what you're figuring out what your issue is, because I I would suggest that Stacey's issue and my issue are completely different different issues. issues. Right. And we got to deal with them totally differently. Yeah. And I also think the other thing, like I would say to this, because it kind of feels to me like, so this person who wrote this obviously didn't have an issue getting things done before they got promoted to management. Mm -hmm. What that sort of signals to me is that probably they're still trying to do all those things and now manage people. (laughs) And that is not the point, right? Yeah, so much (laughs) for the promotion. And I think sometimes people just don't know how to delegate. Hello, I'm raising my hand if people could see me right now, right? So, you know, so maybe there's some issues here with delegation and realizing now you've been promoted to a management position. Probably you don't have to do as much of the actual work. You're managing people who are doing the work. So how do you think about how you can get some of that off of your plate? And yes, I know that like at the beginning, you're like, what the heck? It could take so much. It's way quicker if I just do it. But 
long term, if you can like train the people around you and they're doing it, like think about how much time you'll free up. Yeah. Uh, if I recommend a book, it's called The Responsibility Virus. And I can't off the top of my head think of who wrote it, but I will put it in the show notes. And it's all about delegation and about being able to, especially if you're a newly promoted manager, like making sure that you've set appropriate boundaries between what is your job and what is not your job and how you can communicate that with people in a, in a sort of helpful, open way, rather than, you know, turning into a jerk about it, exactly. which is what usually happens. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Nonprofit Everything, where we tackle all of your nonprofit issues, challenges, and questions. Check us out at nonprofiteverything.com and uh, let us know how we're doing. Uh, is, is there something else we should be adding? Is there a question you have that we can answer? Uh, we would love to hear from you. And as you know, this is presented by Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits and my wonderful co-host, Andy Shirk, and I uh, enjoy spending time with you until next time. Mm-hmm.